The Last of Us Part 2 Gain Ground and McQueen This is Staying In One of the things that I get genuinely when I've had a hard day or a hard week or a hard month I uh, I come home and I go to the shop just on the way home and they it is a magic shop Is this a secret Peter? You, you've got very yeah, quite it's, these it's quite a, hushed tones that you're telling us this it's a, it's a secret. It's a local Bristol secret. I won't tell the name of the shop because then people will figure out where I live. But um, in Bristol, it's the shop Tesco. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> ah, no, that is not the magical emporium. Yeah, yeah. Welcome to Sainsbury's. I've I've heard of um, this place. Wh- Waiter Rose. Um, no, it's it's another. It's a, an independent little um, corner shop, basically, and you go in. And you immediately, on, from the outside, you think, that's oh, just a normal corner shop. You know, the sort of place where you go and buy booze and cigarettes and mucky magazines. But... Well, you do. Well, <laughs> I don't buy cigarettes, mate. Come on, I gave that up. Yeah, did, did, did correct us on the mucky magazines. <laughs> uh, let's move on. So, uh, like, but you go in and uh, you you think to yourself, oh, just, you know, it's, it's your average sort of store. And instead, it's not. Because you go into the back, the further back you go, the more incredible culinary delights there are available. There is a freezer full of homemade curry. There is a, in packs, there's a... Then you go past the fur coats and there's like a lamppost no, and it's snowing. but you go past, I was like, one time I just thought, do you know what, I need this very specific spice mix. I want, I, I'll just go into the shop on the way home. I'll bet they won't have it. They had it. Not only did they have it, they had the light version. And I was just like... This is incredible. It's an amazing treasure trove of food. And I, and I go in there on the way home and I go over to the freezer section. And I've got a very well stocked vegetarian area, which I'm very thankful for. And I go in and I dig right into the big into the big freezer section and I pull out hash browns. I'll pull those hash browns out and I'll go, yes. And then I'll go, I'll dig further deeper in and I'll pull out frozen pizza. And I go, oh, hello. And I'll put that in as well. And then I'll dig straight deep all the way down. Can I, can I just say, so far, Pete, what you're saying you get from there, that's not special. Hash browns I'll and dig. pizza is not special. I'll dig all, dig all the way down. <laughs> it's like it's a Minecraft level. Or oh, I've gone through the hash brown vein. <laughs> and I'll pull out, I pull out the final item, which is, you remember those naff vegetarian burgers when you were a kid in school? The ones that were... That were sort of mashed potato on the inside and then breaded on the outside, not the yeah, weird like bean ma- burgers, mashed up ones. Yeah, those ones. It's not. It's not beans in it, but it's, it's like cauliflower and peas. And it's that orange, that bright yeah, orange. Yeah, bread yeah, yeah, yeah. Like so. like sweet corn and horrible stuff in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I pull out all three of those things and then I go over. I waddle over to the to <laughs> the waddle. counter. <laughs> yeah, and he's, then he's I, heavily laden with frozen food. And I go home and I cook all of that and I eat it all and I then I eat that and then I fall asleep. <laughs> And that's it. And that's what I do when I'm feeling like, oh, I've had a hard week. Um, hey, but you it can is... go to any shop and get frozen hash browns, frozen pizza and frozen veggie burgers. I think you just need to go to more shops. The co-op near me is very... I'll be honest, I live in a... How to describe it? I live in a very... Liberal part of Bristol. And that means that when I go into my co-op, there isn't that junk food because everyone's like, oh, no, I don't want this kind of rubbish littering up our neighbourhood. So I have to go to the little corner shop near me and I'll pick those up and it's great. And it's, it's in a brown paper bag. Yeah. Heaven forbid the neighbours see what you've bought. Are there, are there, are there, is the food in like kind of plain like boxes without any kind of advertising on the outside that you kind of just like someone's written the yeah. word on it so you, you aren't allowed yeah. to actually show what they are? Just... Yeah, yeah, right under the counter and stuff. I'll have, uh, I'll have, I'll have a box of smileys, uh, some McCain oven oven cooked chips, and a magazine of porn, please. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what they call them. <laughs> <laughs> I've been going through recently a bit of a, I guess not. Not like a nostalgia hit. I guess it's like a nostalgia for a time I didn't... I sort of experienced, but don't really remember experiencing. So I've been going through stuff like... I mean, I'm nearly at the end of um, the complete series of Seinfeld now. So I started that, like, must be earlier like early this year or late last year or something like that. 
and I'm nearly through the entire box set of like nine series. Um, and that reminds me, like watching Seinfeld reminds me like how different a time it was in the 90s when I was doing all of my growing up. Like we forget about how different things are now. Like we've only had social media for like, what, six years? And it feels like it's been around forever. And watching Seinfeld and stuff like that, there's really strange sentences that just wouldn't work in a and and situations in this situation you know sit in this sitcom um that just would not work anymore like there's whole plot threads about well Jerry agrees to meet with Kramer at the cinema at a specific time and then Kramer doesn't turn up and then Jerry is left not knowing what to do like whole threads whereby now you just go you just just call them on the mobile, won't you? Just call them up. Why would you ever organise to meet at a specific time and place? And I don't think that's. I don't think that like that specific thing. Gee, yeah, we we'll just meet in town. Where? Oh, it doesn't matter. I'll just call you and we'll figure it out there from there. But I'm reminded of that, um, and um, I'm also sort of going down this sort of slight nostalgia train because I'm currently playing Game Ground. <laughs> Have I told you about Game Ground? No, no, you haven't. No, have I not? Okay, so I just harp on about this on um, Twitter like all the time um it's like one of my favorite games full stop like it's one of my favorite video games um and i played it when i was very young i used to play it on the sega master system did you guys have a sega master system or a mega drive i had a mega drive mega drive was my first Um, i borrowed the neighbors we weren't allowed a console you weren't allowed one no i didn't get my first console to the the very first the, the baby ps1 well the little white one yeah that's my first ever console. How did... Okay, let's put that the Gain Ground conversation on, on pause just for a moment. How... What, what do you mean you weren't allowed one? You just They just said... you just Your folks just said, no. Nah. No, they wouldn't buy one for us, which is absolutely fine. But, like, we were allowed to play on them. So, like... Oh. I'd go around and play my mate's uh, N64. Oh, so you, you did have games in your life? Yeah, I had, yeah, but I just didn't own one. That's what I meant. Oh, right, right, right. But uh, Didn't have that pleasure, unfortunately. But, Dan, you're saying you had a Mega Drive. I did have a Mega Drive, yeah. That was my very, very first console. Okay, what games did you have on it? Ooh, Sonic. Uh, all of the Sonics. Um, all right. I had Mickey and Donald's World of Illusion. That's a good game. Um, what else did I have? I'm trying to just remember the boxes. Cause remember, kind of, yeah, those like big chunky cartridges. Uh, Do you have Cool Spot? I think I played Cool Spot, but I think I think I played a, a PC version of Cool Spot. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, I can't remember now. Streets of Rage. Oh, that's a classic. I did play Streets of Rage. I don't think I ever owned Streets of Rage, but I did play Streets of Rage. Mm. Every, everyone played Streets of Rage. Everyone played. Streets yeah, of I don't. Rage. I don't know how I. Cause I can't imagine my parents would have bought me Streets of Rage, but I definitely played it. Mm, and like because no, Dan, you and I, we lived on the streets of rage. We did, we did indeed. <laughs> that, that that was that was the term. We we grew up in yep. such a terrible area. They were referred to as yep. as the streets of rage. You were walking around Brum, punching bins, eating the chicken out of them. I was just I was just walking around, smacking people in the head with a skateboard. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't yeah. really prop. We didn't. We never turned to move. We always strafed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. So uh, okay, so, but you but you you never played Gain Ground that that never came up as a, no. Uh, I have. I'll be honest with you, sitting right here right now, I don't know what Gain Ground is. Don't know what that is. I know of the name, but that is it. So I love Gain Ground, and it was a game I played on the Master System, which came before the Mega Drive. I used to play it around my uh, my friend Anthony's house, and um, he and I would try and play through Gain Ground, and you know, like being dumb kids, we just wouldn't really understand how to play the game. And we'd sort of get as far as we possibly could and then die because you'd run out of lives. Because, again, completely different time. Time where you had lives. What a bizarre thing. And then you, if you if you got to the end and, like, you died, you'd have to start the whole thing again. No saves. No, you started no. the game with three lives. And if you oh. didn't earn more, that was all you had. That is... Just thinking about that now actually fills me with anxiety. Just like the the idea. I remember there being situations where kind of like it'd be like me, my sister, and my mum would be there, and we'd be like, okay, what we'll what we'll do is we're gonna we're gonna try and play we're gonna play Sonic, and we're gonna see how far we can get because yeah. there was no way of finishing it other than doing it in one sitting. Yeah, and that's bizarre. 
to yeah. think that's a bit, that's not a small game. But you had no. to get to the end. You had to do it in one sitting. How did your mum get on with it? Yeah, how was how was how, how did your mum do? She all right at Sonic? Uh, she tends to just watch. Yeah, yeah. Super she, was, she wasn't really into it, really. Yeah, yeah. She's more the tails to your Sonic. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I, so yeah, I mean, absolutely bizarre period of time. Thinking about that now, like games are, they were just way too. They were just punishing. They weren't hard. They were just punishing. Um, but there were some really cool ideas that happened in that era that in terms of the ev- like if you think about games and genres as evolutionary paths right so think of like darwinian models of evolution where you have you know a specific genus and then it splits off and becomes something different like what it will try what part of it will continue on and then part of it will split off and go oh okay actually i'm gonna go over here i'm like it starts off as like well look i'm a fish and then it evolves off and goes all right now i'm a frog and then the fish is like all right see you later and then the frog goes off and splits off into all the evolution so (laughs) that's how it works incredible so uh, richard dawkins watch out um so um if you think of video game genres in that way then you can look at specific genres and you can see how they've evolved from where they've come from. So the very first video game that we think of as a video game is a game called Space War, which is a top-down uh, game played on a, on an oscilloscope, which is rad. Uh, like So, like, radar uh, visual equipment is what you play on. Um, so, um, basically, a top-down shooter and you have to fly around in the little space. It's all on one screen and you all that sort of stuff and then you would have it would then move on and it would become something like asteroids or it would become and then after that you had okay well instead of top down why don't we go side on and you had things like um scramble which was uh which then became gradius and salamander and r type and you would see how these games would they would go okay now we're side scrolling games and they would all go down that angle and then there would be other ones that would be like okay i'm actually gallagher and it's still all single screen and it's all top down but now you're just moving left to right so you can see the evolutionary paths of all of these um of all of these games and game ground is at the end is at the dead end of an evolutionary thread because basically it's a top down what used to be called action games um Whereby you control a little soldier man or woman or cyborg, and you get them to you choose which one you want to go into this this level, top down level, and then you figure out how to either get your entire party, i.e., your individual person. Then when you get them out, the next person, you have to figure out how to get each individual party member to this big yellow block that says exit, or kill all of the enemies on the map. Okay, and on the map is geometry so on the first level it's like a big grassy plain and then uh but there are also a couple of little walls now when you press one of the buttons uh, it fires your normal shot which tends to just be one single uh shot that goes along you know goes kind of like horizontal to you in any direction that you want that you're facing in and then when you press the alternative fire button, you do an alternative fire that is something very different and is unique to that character. And another cool thing is sometimes you can see little pictorial representations of the other player character models that you can actually go and grab. And they're out on the actual battlefield. And if you run over to them, then you start carrying them. And you carry them over to the exit, then you get to have them with you as well. There's no real sense of like lives or anything like that. Um, it's much more focused on like how many characters can you get. Because the more characters you have, the more choices you have to actually play the game and, and figure out how to get through these maps. And the reason that it's an evolutionary dead end is because it's not really trying to be an action game. It's got action elements. So it is a little bit top down like... Um, playstation one era so like loaded and reloaded um and those kinds of top down actions you will go along and shoot at this thing and make them explode kinds of games um it is an evolution of that but it's an evolution whereby a good 10 seconds 20 seconds of the start of the game and you're on a timer it's just you sat there looking at the map thinking 
which combination of abilities and character players am I going to use to get through this area so that I don't die? Like, so that I don't lose any of these characters. Because once they die, those characters are gone. And if you don't have a full complement of heroes towards the end of the game, like, or t- to be honest, some of the levels, you just aren't going to get past them at all. And the creator of this game tried to create their own genre, and they called it algorithm action. Um, an algorithm action, for me, is this idea that when I so when I play when I play Game Ground, and I've been playing it because um, basically because Sega's just released this uh, Sega Classics Collection, I think it's called. Um, the uh, the Sega Genesis Classics or the Sega Mega Drive Classics, I think it's called. Um, they just re-released it, basically, because they re-released it and everything. Um, and I picked up Game Ground again. And when I've been playing Game Ground, I feel weirdly calm. Like, it's a really intense action game, but you feel strangely calm about it because you set up these ideas of how you're going to move through this space long before you actually start doing it. But it's, it sounds kind of... And obviously it's a strategic strategy game, but when you describe it in terms of the, the elements of kind of planning your moves ahead and working mm-hmm. out that strategy of how you can do it, it almost sounds like you're describing something like chess kind of kind of thing. Because Yeah, but it's but it's all real time. It's an action game. Like it's not a strategy game. That's yeah. that's the mad thing about it. Like, you're right. It feels like I'm going, Okay, I need to I need to do this, then I need to do this, then I need to do this. Go. And then you try and do it. Mm. Yeah. Sort of you say it. kind of that it's at the end of kind of evolutionary thread, but would you not think that something along the lines of an XCOM or something like that is an evolution on this idea? There's there's little ideas, definitely. There's little like traits and ideas that are, that are taken out of absolutely everywhere, and obviously we're always inspired by everything, right? Like in terms of any medium, but there's no there's no successor. There's no like direct successor to Game Ground. There's no. You can't go onto Steam and get like an indie game that's basically trying to be that, right? Like you can go and find something that plays like Advance Wars. That's on Steam. That's on mobile. Like you can go and find all that sort of stuff. You can find, go and find something that plays basically like Pokemon or is the next step of Pokemon, like Jade Cocoon, for example. You can see how those games have evolved, but there's nothing, absolutely nothing, like a, a, a sequel to Game Ground, um, with the sole exception of they did a pseudo sequel themselves, a sort of re- remake called SX. Um, and then there was like a Sega Ages HD remake or something. Was there not a version on the PS2? Yeah, there's a there's a there's a HD. So they did a. It was called Sega Ages, and it was on. It was a sort of. It was an HD remake, 3D remake of the first game, and it was meant to be all right. Um, but no, there's no there's no direct sequel, and and there's no spiritual successor either. So where games like Galaxian. Uh, which would then turn into a, which would then turn into like an Aero Fighters, uh, and then it would have like a, a Sonic would turn into a Crash Bandicoot. Yeah, probably. yeah, exactly. Where where you would see those sorts of things, and there would always be the next thing. Because if you look at something like, you know, you see like Sonic, and then like let's say like yeah, as you say like Crash Bandicoot, uh, you can see how that would then move on, and then the next successor to stuff like Crash Bandicoot and and those kinds of things was stuff like Tomb Raider. Because back in the day, you would hear people talking about Tomb Raider as a platformer. And actually, it was kind of a, a very hard fork off in its own direction of, well, there is platforming, but it's not really a platform. And then it creates its own, you know, its own genre. And we, we recognize Tomb Raider to be the incredible like genre founder that it is today that would then go on to make Uncharted. With Game Ground, there is nothing like that. Like, there's just, this is it. Like this is the only kind of game, and and maybe somebody will come along and do something a little bit different, and and maybe do another one of these. But you two haven't heard of it, and you're quite into games, like, and Sega keeps re-releasing it as part of its Sega Classics Collection, but no one's talking about it. Like, well, how how many games are on the Classics Collection? There's like forty five. Exactly. It's massive, but that's yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because you go and buy that that collection, and you go, oh, I'm going to play Sonic One. Absolutely, yeah. Of course you are. Of course you are. Because why would you? Why would you go and figure out what decap attack is? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. But you can get stuff like Comic Zone on on mobile now. Can you? Is, is yeah. there, Can you not get Game Ground on there at the moment? Is there no plans I, for that? Legitimately, I have 
legitimately sent emails to Sega <laughs> <laughs> saying, 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 I know that you're doing all of these. Uh... <laughs> just, you know, just emailing them saying, there's one thing missing from my potato smiley meal. Exactly. Exactly. All I need is a little bit of gain ground on my mobile phone. <laughs> Well, it's interesting. You, you're kind of having this nostalgic trip mm. into some kind of your 90s heyday, mm. let's call it. Well, Game Ground was first released in 1988. 1988, okay. but I, I was playing it in probably 89, very late 89, 90, um, like going around Powell's houses and stuff like that. Um, Chris, I wouldn't call it a heyday. Heyday, heydays, heydays sort of suggests that the, my best days are over. Well, it's the Willington Bell Curve, again. Because <laughs> um, for me, yeah. the game that I think everyone should be talking about after E3 2018, which right. I know it's been and gone, it's it's old news now, the thing that got me really excited was uh, the Spyro Reignited Trilogy. Is there, is there a new trilogy of Spyro games? Is it new or HD? No, no, it's a remastered... Uh, no, when I say remastered, not just a simple HD port. I think it's right. similar to what they did with Crash Bandicoot, isn't it? It's a similar process. Yeah, yeah. Oh. so kind of rebuilt from the ground up. Ooh. But still, and this is something they've really worked hard on, still giving you that same kind of feeling of holding that original PlayStation 1 controller. Mm. Everything from the glide, the headbutting, the rolling, everything. They've worked very hard on trying to do this. Mm. So this isn't Insomniac Games. This is, I think, Bob's Toys, I think it is, or Big Bob's Toys. I can't remember the name right. of the company that have done it. But it looks gorgeous. I've, I've seen um, still images of it, and, it, and it, it does look fantastic. It's exactly how I expect it or want it to look. There's the familiar places there. I can play Spyro with my eyes closed. I know every single nook and cranny of that. Really? Were you, were you a really big fan of it, then? It's the, it's the kind of the one platformer that i know inside out um i'd say for, for me I, I think i probably had a similar feeling towards sonic and then pro- later on crash bandicoot as you do with, with spyro spyro i played it but i don't know it, it never never grabbed hold of me in the same way that it, it appears it appears did for you well this is going to be an exciting autumn for you dan it is indeed what what better way for toby to have his first gaming experience oh his first gaming experience will be the last of us too <laughs> oh God! Don't oh, don't set Toby up for that. That's no, be... no. I think as we've already established on this podcast, his first gaming experience will be Oddworld Soulstorm. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. That, yeah. That, that's already uh, part of the writing, part of the published information of this podcast. That's locked in. Um, so, so what's so good about? Because I never actually played Spyro. Um, what's so good about it? I always kind of looked at it and went, it sort of looks like a slightly worse. Well, I'd say what it, I think in part it wasn't. It was more to the fact that it was a very um, attractive and appealing game to lots of different people in my family. So right. it's one of those games. It was a rare game, a bit like you, Dan. Actually, it was a rare game where me and my siblings could all play it together. We take it in turns, pass the controller. It had these very bright, gorgeous visuals in which you're just really hopping between worlds, freeing dragons from their kind of crystal prisons. And then finally, um, preparing for the big showdown with the, the villain named Nasty Nork. But I really hope that they, I hope they do stuff that's slightly different, but okay. we'll see. It's a really tricky tightrope, this. I can't imagine what it must be like taking somebody else's baby mm. and then upgrading it for 2018. I, th- I think mm. those kind of things, they can go two different ways. Cause if you, if you look at the Crash Bandicoot remake, I think, a lot of people kind of played it and kind of went, ooh, this doesn't play quite as well as I remembered, and it's it right. looks nice, but... Uh. Whereas in the other direction, and obviously it wasn't um, visually different, but if you look at something like Sonic Mania, um, which is obviously looking back, that was fantastic, and that was very well received. Um, mm-hmm. And obviously it's doing different things in terms of the, the visual style um, to what Spyro and Crash Bandicoot did in terms of maintaining that original aesthetic. Um, but th- there are two different ways you can go about it. And what Sonic Mania did really well was was introduce the new features on top. Not necessarily new features, but new elements on top of what you already knew. So it'd be interesting to see if they're doing that with Spyro, of having that core game and then 
kind of looking and saying, well, okay, well, this is the core game. What can we do to enhance it for this yeah. modern audience? Now, knowing what we know about games now, now that we have all this kind of history of what works, what doesn't, let's see if we can improve it without fundamentally changing what made the original great. Well, there are a lot of... Because um, it's, it's strange, isn't it, how the games industry keeps going back to these old classics and digging them out and giving them a new lick of life and trying to maybe improve like improve upon the original or at least capture some of the magic of the original like there was a lot of that stuff at E3 of of Final Fantasy 7 and and um stuff that like even you know um Resident Evil 2 Resident Evil 2 like which looks which you know when i heard that they were doing a, an HD remake um I sort of thought to myself, all right, okay, great. Like, uh, hopefully it's more like the Resident Evil 1 remake because that was actually good, whereas the eight, the, the sort of, like, updated ports that, that were on the GameCube were just a bit naff or a, a bit sort of underwhelming. It was a few years ago where you had probably, like, a slew of HD remasters, which, yeah. I mean, if you look at, like, the Metal Gear Solid trilogy that were HD remastered, it wasn't a massive change, really. The games, obviously, were, were the same, Um but there weren't all that much difference. Whereas now, yeah. with the ones we just mentioned and with Resident Evil, they are saying, "Okay, then let's re- remake it, rebuild this game from the from the yeah. from the ground up." And I think that's yeah. where these ones are different now. That it's it's introducing you, and you know when you play it that it's not just the old game with a slightly shinier skin on the front of it. You mm. know, the kind of it's been built, and those kind of things they can fix the things that were a problem before whilst maintaining the stuff that, that worked. I mean, stuff like Resident Evil 2, you'd have to maintain certain things. The stuff of the fixed cameras and stuff like that, that's in the DNA. As annoying as it was at times, that's in the DNA of that game. So you wouldn't... I mean, I, I'm assuming they're not dropping that because that, I think that would be a, a, an incredibly bad mistake if they did. Well, they are. <laughs> so so that's the thing. Like, to, like and they, this is the double-edged sword. Like... How how do you go back and do? Because for me, like I'm glad they don't they don't have that fixed camera angle stuff anymore. And some of the stuff that they're doing in RE2's remake is amazing. Like for example, there's a whole new system in there whereby you can actually aim specifically at certain body parts of the enemy. And if you take out their leg, for example, or their arm, um, if you take out their leg, they will fall to the floor and then begin crawling towards you or limping towards you if you take their other leg out they'll begin crawling across the floor with just their hands if you take out one of their arms it's just the one that will be coming after you now just from a purely how to make video games perspective that sounds amazing because to me it's like wow I I can't think of any games that have done that yet but you're right that's not Resident Evil 2 that's a that's Resident Evil 2's story in a totally different game engine with probably very different mechanics i think of resident evil 2 i think of the fixed camera angles i fit i yep. think of when you enter a room the black screen with the door that opens yeah uh, that's, that's what that's yep. what i think of those things and then the one time when the door opens and before the lights come back up zombies appear you're like ah that's and then the, the sound before you see them you hear the zombies that's what i think of resident evil don't get me wrong i, I was never a huge fan of resident evil games because i was a, I was a bit of a wuss um i right. don't like scary things um, right. They scare me. Why would I want to experience that? Um, but I did it. I did play some of those games, mm. and that's those are the things that I remember from them. But that's it. Nostalgia is, is like that's the problem with it. Like I I I agree. Like why don't they have fixed fixed camera angles? Like and it's the same with the FF Seven remake, right? Like that team. First of all, they split it into three games, which is just crazy. But also. That team that is making Final Fantasy VII as a remake, no one is going to be happy. Like, they could do the greatest job of that game ever. Like, they can make it the greatest game of all time, and everyone will hate it. Or 50% of the audience will hate it, because it won't have... Because the number of things on there that will annoy people will be so great like oh what do you mean you change barrett's voice acting from that really really super dodgy uh translation that we did what do you mean there aren't four different quality models of of uh, qualities of all of the models that's why is that like if you change any element 
of the game. Oh, it's not, you know, like, if it's not turn-based combat, if it's not all of the items in the game, if they add items, if they take away items, if they change difficulties, if they make it easier, if they make it harder, if they keep it the same. Visually, that game doesn't look anything like FF7. People people saw FF7 when they were playing it on the PlayStation. They were like, this is what the world looks like. And then you saw it in Crisis Core, and you were like, that's not Final Fantasy VII. That's some weird anime you know nonsense and that's kind of the visual style they're going with for for the for the remake and it just i don't know it's a bit like um gus van is it gus van Sate who directed the remake of psycho it's kind of an exercise he took hitchcock's film and he reshot it verbatim yeah shot for shot he shot exactly the same yeah what? shot for shot remake in color with different actors and it, it's an in, it was an interesting exercise for him it was basically like a classic kind of film school exercise, you know. Find a director or auteur that you kind of, whose style that you may want to emulate as part of your learning. And he kind of took it one step further. So you've got the entire film redone verbatim, you know, the shot type, the shot length, just different actors, obviously a different period. But obviously there you, you've, you've got somebody tr- taking what is essentially a, a critically acclaimed film an immensely influential film and let's say doing the HD remake of it yeah. and and, and it can what artistic licenses can you take with Hitchcock in that regard it's right. interesting right uh, yeah it, it's just who's going to be happy the answer who, no, no one no one's going to be happy and i'm sure it's a great game i'm sure it's going to be a great game i really hope all three of those games sell millions and millions of dollars and i'm absolutely sure the first one will the, for me for me, my favourite thing about E3, I, I sort of looked at some of the games and thought they all looked... Some of the games looked pretty cool. Uh, but the the thing that I loved um, was the sense of schadenfreude that I got when I watched the Gears of War uh, mobile game reveal and watching people's piss boil as the Command and Conquer mobile free-to-play game was announced. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, all that stuff. Like, that was that was the height of E3 for me, because it was just, like, seeing that stuff, like, kick off on Twitter, like, oh, my gosh, new Gears of War. What? What is this? What? <laughs> like, and it's, like, and it's a, it's a vinyl, like, Gears of War meets vinyl pop, or whatever they're called, pop vinyl. That, as a free-to-play mobile game, with the Gears of War characters. I was like, great. This is this is brilliant. Who dreamed this up? A master troll, Pop Funko. An absolute master troll. And seeing like the reaction to Command and Conquer coming back, but as a free to play mobile game was just like Oh yeah. I could just oh settle in. Settle in. It was it was actually quite interesting kind of watching some of those kind of events, because obviously every year the the, the dominant events are obviously microsoft and sony they kind of dominate a lot of it and and nintendo as well yeah i um, mean obviously you've got stuff like ubisoft and ea and they, they all do this but often it's dominated by those big those big two and sometimes big three and it was for the and obviously kind of they've they they've treated their showcases as, as they were called kind of differently over the past few years and i think the issue is very much it was very clear how they were both viewing their audiences in terms of Microsoft and uh, Sony. And Microsoft, it felt like any other kind of year where it was just kind of like quantity over quality. Like we've got all these games. It looked exactly the same. Whereas Sony weren't showing many games, were showing you footage of games they've already announced. I think it's probably because they didn't have anything new to announce. So they said, okay, we'll just give you lots of what you already know about. Yep. But also they, they, they try and create an experience with live music and the open they they opened the whole thing with like a, a ten minute section where all the audience were in a church that matched up with The Last of Us and then they all moved into an arena, which was a bit weird. Um, That's weird. Yeah, it was but it was really I found it really interesting just to see those two differences of how they addri- how they approach mm. the their biggest show of the year. Well, Microsoft, of course, this year, they were kind of reacting to the fact that the pervading sort of messaging from people who 
are who love games is that there are no Microsoft console exclusives. Yeah. It's just this idea that where are the games? Why why would you pick Xbox over PlayStation 4? So I think the reason that they came out and just were just like bang, here's 40 odd games. <laughs> like see see you in 6 months. Like that was really cool because that was them definitely understanding their community and like responding to it like like yeah we get you okay we hear you yes we need some more exclusives here you go here's i mean they 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 showed forza for example i mean forza for me was like yes great cool brilliant that's what that, we need more of that you know crackdown and um a uh, new halo and like just like it's a box ticking exercise of just yes, all like, different things. like you will get your halo you will get your you know whatever and that's that is what they needed to do because like genuinely that was becoming a really i think embarrassing sort of thread line for them at that time of like why would you pick that unless like the only reason you would pick xbox one i think last year if you were buying a new console is because your friends had it otherwise like you would you would definitely go grab a ps4 um and i think that it's really cool that they've announced so much stuff because it makes it makes the race better like it makes absolutely competition will always improve yeah. things so at the, at the moment i think it's quite telling that on the flip side sony announced nothing really yeah it, it very as, as i just said there it felt very much like they didn't have anything anything in a position to announce that was big so they just went the other direction and says you know these four games so we're going to give you features of these and this is going to be our way of showing you what this is our decision we've chosen to do it this way well no yeah. you've been kind of forced into doing it this way and you've made the best of a bad situation not to say that what yeah. they showed wasn't great and there was some lovely stuff um some stuff that i'm really excited about some stuff that i'm not sure about some stuff i thought meh don't really care um but there just wasn't anything new I guess, yeah, but I guess if you're in a position of dominance, right? Like, Oh, yeah. There was no, but for me, there was nothing for me to get excited about beyond what I already know. For me, I think it's a it's a, it's a a boring one. But it, And it was the one that I was probably most looking f- forward to going in. Go on. And that's, that still remains The Last of Us Part 2. Um, I just think, especially in the trailer they showed, the, the two halves of it, the, the kind of the cut scene... I thought was incredible the the kind of the work they're doing there in the modeling of of the kind of the motion capture and the performances is insane um mm. to the kind of the the little micro expressions that make those characters come alive everything about that and then I love the fluidity of the gameplay now obviously this is a this is a trailer shown at E3 they're going to show it in its best possible case with the best yeah. possible player um, yeah. When it's me playing, it's not going to be as fluid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stumble and bump into walls and all that jazz. Yeah. I get that. But when Toby's playing, though, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I was very disappointed to see uh, some of the feedback that they got comparing the kind of um, having the the cutscene of uh, the character of Ellie and Dina. I think it was um, a kind mm-hmm. of romantic relationship there. Mm-hmm. Uh, juxtaposed against the kind of the violence of the, of the gameplay and people saying that the only reason they'd put the violence in was because gamers want that and that kind of thing and I people complaining about the lead character being Ellie and stuff like that and I think actually I've got a, a tweet from someone at uh, Naughty Dog called Boone Cotter who says if you're so socially and culturally inept that the option to play a video game as a female gets you all worked up in a frothy nerd rage my name is Boone. I make games, but not for people like you. Your kind is done, mate. Do everyone a favour and f*** off. You're embarrassing. <laughs> oh, gonna... There we are. Sam's got his little beat button out. Um, hey, that was in the tweet. That was in the tweet. I'm, that's not come out of me. That's Someone else said that. I, I like that it, as yeah. a... If people had complained about that, as unfortunately there are sectors of the game-playing uh, audience that will react in that way. And I like that as a response. Yeah, yeah, I like that as well. I like the fact that we can start saying things like, hey, guess what? We ain't making games for you. Like, other people can make those games for you. That's fine. But if you don't like two girls kissing, then guess what? We ain't making a, sh- <laughs> we ain't making a weird zombie shooty game for you. <laughs> <laughs> what, a strange, what a strange dynamic that is. Yeah. Like, it's just like, 
Do you know what comfortable with two, two people who love each other showing their affection for one another? Oh, we're not making you a game about plant zombies then. <laughs> like, <laughs> very strange. But um, no, good. Good on them. What did you guys think? Because you've been quite quiet as I mentioned The Last of Us. I feel like you're not that enthused. I am, Dan. It's just that like, I, I love The Last of Us. It's an incredible game. It's just every time I think back to my experience of playing it, I just remember just wanting to have like a little glass of whiskey after every level. It's just, for me, it was such a tense experience, The Last of Us. An incredibly tense experience. I mean, it reminded me of films such as, say, like The Road, say, for example, which I know is another film that you like, Dan, and the book you like as well. Like is a strong um, word because it's. it's yeah, a, I know. It's yeah, a, it's, that's the thing. How do you. It's about how you kind of. I, I, so it would depend for me. It would depend for me what where my head is at when I play the game. I, I if if my head is there when it comes out and I want to buy it, I will buy it. I will play this game because I have to because I, I know I will enjoy it. Oh yeah, absolutely. This is the kind of game that you you don't just throw on as a casual Saturday afternoon couple of hours. You need to <laughs> yeah. be in the right frame of mind to to to, to properly appreciate it because it's trying to do interesting things. It's trying to tell an interesting yeah. story. So you need yeah. to be able to be in a be in a frame of mind to be able to engage with that i'm really happy that well i'm really happy that people are happy that last of us 2 is coming out right and there's a distinction there because i don't think that game needs a sequel because i think that game that first game which i didn't like i think it has probably the one of the best endings in all video games because they actually knew how to end it like they were like here's an ending that's not an explosion like, which is pretty cool. Um, I thought they ended that game really, really well. Out of the four of us, who do you reckon is the most fashionable? Well, one of us wore a suit with a rucksack inside. Hmm. Yeah, I think, I think, I think those two things cancelled each other yeah, out somewhat. So, <clears throat> so not, so not me. Um, <laughs> I would say, uh, I mean, Dan, you've got a, you've certainly got an eye for fashion. Whether or not it's a good eye, I don't know. Surely everyone has an eye for fashion. But you've got a very specific style that you go for. You've got the, you go for the, I am a 45 year old man. Like, look. Do I? The flat cap. The, uh, the, what else? The tweed jacket. The, uh, the copy of, uh, the Inquirer. Underneath the arm that I always see, <laughs> the 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 twirling cane, huh? the uh, go on. Now, I'm, I'm curious the, as to how you see me. The um, the monocle, the big handlebar <laughs> moustache, the monocle. You are you just describing me as the guy, f- the, the the character from Monopoly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Here's another question then. So, have you any of you ever heard of Alexander McQueen? Yes, I have. No, there you go. I think Dan wins. It, <laughs> yeah, <I'd> see, <laughs> that, that's the litmus test. So Dan was Dan was right about McQueen, and I was right about fashion. Yes, it's extraordinary. Well, you know, you know, that one of those trends, Pete, where you'll get you'll see people wearing like like shoes, like trainers' shoes with very thick soles. Yeah, that's Alex, that's Alexander McQueen. He was basically the he was a fashion designer, British fashion designer, and one of the one of his kind of trademark designs, let's say. And I'm rendering him a disservice here because ultimately he was an extraordinary human being. One of the things that people may not realise is him is is that style. Okay, that has been copied and emulated in various different ways. So, so he's a he's a, he's like a fashion designer, like catwalk fashion. He was a fashion designer, yes. Okay. So, um, I went to see. Um, a documentary at the cinema uh, a couple of nights ago called McQueen, uh, which basically tells the story of his life. Um, he tragically died at the age of 40. So the, the kind of documentary is kind of split into two halves, really. You, you kind of see him as a young man. And he was, what I love about, what I loved about the man was that he was just a bit of a, a bit of a chancer. He was always, particularly early on in his career, he was always living on a shoestring. He's certainly not someone who you, when you think of a, a fashion designer, He's not the. He's not who you'd have in your mind. He's not that picture in your mind. No, he's he's kind of like he's kind of like a, he was an East Ender kind of uh, guy. Um, grew up in a very 
loving family. Uh, didn't really take much of an interest in school, except he loved drawing clothes. And he just blight, he just, he, he just literally walked into Savile Row and just said, look, I can, I, I can do good work, good work here. And they were just, there was this kind of just look they gave him saying, okay, I'm curious. I'll, let's, let's try out, see how you get on. And he basically did that with every job. He'd just walk in. He'd just walk in and says, look, I can, I can fit a suit better than anyone. Get, you need to give me a job. And this is just how he kind of worked his way, learning the skills. And he became so good that he, you know how so, some people, when they are fitting a suit, they then get the tape. Okay. It doesn't quite fit. I'll get, I've seen this now because I've been, doing the rounds with Sam, doing suit fittings and stuff. Right, right. You know, they'll get the tape measure and they'll make slight adjustments. He would just walk up with a pair of scissors and just by eye, just cut it and trace it himself in material. Whoa. Extraordinary human being. Um, but, like, he's one of these people, we all know him, where there's something really lovable about him. But there's also something that kind of keeps you a bit of a distance. They'll say stuff, you think, oh, I wish they hadn't said that. I was beginning to really like them. Oh, right. And he just didn't give a shit. I'm sorry, Sam, you have to bleep that. What anyone thought of him at all and he created fashions that were so bold he created shows that were just performance art essentially right but he was doing it on a shoestring like the clothes show the bbc clothes show in the 90s were interviewing him but he had to turn his back to the camera because he was he was funding the show on his doll money and he didn't want to be seen on camera <laughs> because you know he'd get arrested for that right and then he went from that to headlining givenchy you know so he, Suddenly, he's just parachuted into Italy with his mates. Like, one of the people he hired was just, like, a neighbour. And he just, he just knocked on the door and says, hello. And she says, oh, yeah, I do hair and design. He says, oh, do you want to come and do my next show? And then she ended up joining the crew. And <laughs> his shows were just these extraordinary kind of spectacles. And And it's about how he, as this person who didn't care what anyone thought of him, who wanted to shock in a kind of almost Artodian fashion from his audience, um, had to cut butting heads with the fashion world. Do you listen to the podcasts when they go out? Yeah. Well, I, I edit half of them. So yes, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, when they've been editing, they've go out on, into the audio pipes. Um, like I, I, listen, I listen to all of them, obviously, because I, I like the sound of my own voice. And also hearing hearing, uh, hearing what well, you like the sound of my voice, um, we started saying at the end of them now, though people skip over it. Uh, uh, we started saying at the end uh, that people can send us an email uh, to stayinginpod at gmail dot com, um, and basically people can like listeners can basically ask us a question, any question, and we'll maybe read it out. Um, and accept, send it to us via email, or they can send it to us via DM on Twitter or on Facebook. Uh, or anything like that and uh we've got our first one we've got our first question oh i know i'm excited know. so i'm i'm not really sure what to ex- i'm not really sure what to expect from all of these because whenever we've whenever we've chatted with the, our listeners and we have like a few now like first of all shout out to whoever it is that's rinsing our back catalog in vietnam i see you <laughs> i see you in our stats it's amazing and thank you uh uh but basically um it's really cool when we, whenever we like it's like get to chat with some of the some of the people who listen. But I'm never quite sure what, what what's going to happen. So anyway, I don't know what's going to happen with all these questions, but I hope to hope it hope it you know hope to do a few more of them. Anyway, we've had a question from uh, on uh, via Twitter uh, via Twitter DM from at Lane It Three Sixty, who I think is a long term listener. So uh, thank you for that. Um, so the question is right. Um, question is I need some thoughts. Uh, I'm going to quote unquote design a game uh, using the standees from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Munchkin the zombie standees from Dead of Winter and the board from Zombicide and it's going to be Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles versus zombies, that sounds amazing Uh, I still have to come up with some gameplay and I have the start of the idea for the fiction, does this sound interesting in any way? Uh, obviously it's just going to be for my group of, uh, for me and my group of friends um, and um, uh, basically I, so so he sent me a, a, a link to like so basically these standees are sort of like cardboard standees and they've got pictures of the turtles yeah yeah but like the, the comic book turtles not the cartoon turtles um, and then uh, the sta- and then obviously Dead of Winter well Zombicide is lots of zombies uh, so like the, the 
the board would be like streets and those kinds of things i suppose in in it's kind of like left for dead zombie zombieside kind of stuff um and then dead of winter the zombie standees so i guess just the zombies look look particularly good in dead of winter um so i guess the question is like does teenage mutant ninja turtles versus zombies sound like a good thing uh and what sort I, I and also he's coming he's trying to come up with gameplay at the moment like what is that game what does that game look like well i think that the, in terms of the gameplay i think yep you've absolutely got to be utilizing some kind of sewer system to be yep. able to navigate the map with 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 the turtles um oh right so so there's a map right that you're on and then can you go underneath the map in the i mean sewers? i'm not familiar with the zombie side map if there's a okay. way of being able to adapt, it's like so you a, can. It's like a it's like a street, but you could like yeah. Imagine looking down. In, you remember Grand, the original Grand Theft Auto's down where it's top down on the city. Imagine it looks like yeah. that. Essentially, I would say if you're able to create a sewer system that you could yeah. basically sit underneath that would yeah. enable the turtles to kind of navigate around the board yeah. easier. Yeah. Um, but obviously, because they're outnumbered, that's their disadvantage compared to the zombies. There are more zombies than turtles, but Turtles can get around quicker. Obviously, mm-hmm. that then gives you opportunities later on in the game to then to ramp up the difficulty. The zombies could gain access to the sewer system as well. Right. So that that kind of thing could happen. So is this like a miniature war game? Like, is this like it, a skirmish it, game where you got to go around and shoot it stuff? It feels and... like a strategy game. It feels like a yeah. kind of a um, like a space Hulk type. Mm. Is, is my 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 thinking? That's how it yeah. feels to me. And obviously, like. Some some people are taking on the role of the turtles. Some people are taking on the role of zombies, and they're kind of battling against each other in kind of strategic way. Oh, okay. So so it's not like it's not like each player is one of the turtles. For example, I would be Raphael, cool but rude, um, uh, and Dan, you would be Donatello, does machines. Uh, Sam would be the. <laughs> <laughs> very I, 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 I would have thought, I would have put Chris as Donatello. Do you think so? Yeah. Which which one are you then? We, I feel like we have this conversation like every other episode. I don't think we've ever had this conversation. Who's 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 Michelangelo? That's Sam, isn't it? That's he's Sam. The, he's the Joker of the lot. <laughs> um, yeah. No, you're right. Chris, Chris, Chris does machines, and Dan is the leader. Um, okay, he's the wild card. I'm cool but rude. So, uh, so, so it's not a case of like we would individually play those characters, and then like somebody else would play the zombies, or like maybe the zombies would be automated by like doing dice rolls and stuff. It would be like instead, it would be one person is all the turtles, and maybe I don't know, April O'Neil and Irma. I would say, uh, I would say, depending on the, no- I would say you have your four turtles. Yeah. I would say you have a set number of zombies. Yep. Um, and then depending on however many people you have playing, that number gets split into two teams. Yep. And then the pieces are divided up. So, for example, if on each team there are four people, then on one side you've got four turtles, four people. On the other side, all the zombies are divided into four. So you have four then teams of them that they can move around as they wish in kind of gotcha. hordes and swarms. But obviously, if okay. you've got only two people, it's one on one. Yep. Can I throw in a little bit of gaming equipment so you might want to use component that he might want to use from another game? Cool. If he takes like the Trivial Pursuit kind of cheese things, he could use that as lives like it's a pizza. Oh, oh yes! That is there excellent. You... Well, there you go. There you go. I like the idea of Dan's idea of the sewers, because, but instead of having like a separate map of sewers, mm. you could literally just have a, a, a whatever that decides that, whether it's a dice roll or a card that's played where a character can pop under the sewer and then they're just removed from the board and then they can pop out at yeah, another yeah. point somewhere else on the map. Yeah. So they're using that underground sewer network. Um, whether you also want to have the kind of the enemy, let's say, being you versus the game, I'm just thinking I love those kind of games like Forbidden Desert, say, for example. That's a very light version. It's not quite Space Hulk. Especially if you're going to make it for your friends, right? Like, if you're going to make it for you and your pals, you want to be you want to be the turtles going up against the zombies. You don't want to be, like, some of you are the turtles and some of you are the zombies. You want to be, like, we're all the turtles and we're going to try and beat the zombies. So some sort of, like, automated... Well, you could have a game mode where there isn't, like, a, uh, a card system that controls the zombies. So you could have one oh, against the other. Oh, yeah. Or you could have as a co-op. You could have that as a co-op or a competitive... Na- element 
where it's turtles versus zombies because that's the game so that's the core mm-hmm. game if you do want it to be cooperative there's a card system to allow to tell you that you shuffle and that tells you where the zombies go okay there you go then uh, that's that that's our that our take on that question and then we would like a finished copy of the game sent through with the appropriate credits added to us please please send us your uh game design document uh when it's ready that we can copyright and yeah <laughs> right just straight up dan we will not be able to copyright teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> just no. i'm just saying I'm pretty that. sure pretty sure it's all I'm pretty sure it's, it's it's locked down pretty sure that one's locked what down. if they're middle-aged middle-aged kung fu tortoises Mi- yeah <laughs> Did I, did I ever tell you I was in a play once? It was like a devised play that we wrote in like uh, a couple of hours. And in fact, the playwright was still writing it while we were on stage and was handing page, pages of the script to us while we were performing. It was in the student union. But his concept was that we had Raphael, Donatello, Michelangelo, Leonardo, but we were the original artists, not the turtles. <laughs> and we were under the sewers because the enemy above was modern art. And we were down in the sewers plotting our way to kind of return and retaliate against modern art. And I was Raphael. You were Raphael? Yeah, but I played him like the turtle, even though he was the sculptor. That is some poor casting. I'm I'm going to go out on a limb here. But Pete, have you ever seen any documentaries at the cinema? Mm. Does the Super Mario Brothers movie count? No. Is that a documentary though, Pete? Um, I mean, it is a documentary in like what would happen if King Cooper came through, and then uh, Danny DeVito, whoever it is playing uh, Mario, uh, is it Dan? Do you want to correct him? Or Let's just leave it. Let's just. Anymore. I mean, obviously, he... me and Chris knows, and obviously, everyone listening everyone to this knows. would also know. So let's just let Pete stay in the dark. And like the guy who plays Bowser is that was like one of his last movies as well. Oh man, video game movies have like taken so many stars from us. Like Raul Julia's last one was Street Fighter. Christ. That was staying in with Peter Willington, Daniel Frost, and Chris Darby. If you enjoyed this episode, then make sure to subscribe so you get the latest show as soon as it's released. Also, if you like what we make and you listen to us on something like Apple Podcasts, Stitcher or CastBox, for example, then we'd really appreciate it if you left us a review, a comment or you just make us one of your favourites. Information on all the things we've talked about on this episode is at stayingin.podbean.com where there's also details of how you can get in touch with us if you've got a question for us to answer. And of course, there's also links there to our Steam Curator and Board Game Geek pages, as well as our Twitter and Facebook info. But for now, thanks very much for listening.